All right, thank you all for joining us tonight. Welcome to today's program, Ask the Tough Questions Dental Interview Prep, sponsored by ASDA's Career Compass and Heartland Dental. I'm Brooke Acheris, ASDA's Membership Coordinator here at the Central Office in Chicago. Before we begin, note that all attendees are muted so that we don't pick up any background noise during the program. During the presentation, you'll be able to ask questions of the presenters. You'll notice a control panel on the right side of your screen. You can type into the box questions at any time during the presentation, and at the end, we'll answer as many questions as we can get to. We'll also provide contact information for the presenter if you would like to email them directly. Career Compass is a resource to help prepare you for graduation and transition into the first steps in your career path. ASTA is excited to work with experts in the field, such as Heartland Dental, to develop new programs and resources for you. Visit Career Compass to explore all it has to offer. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Stacy Smith. Stacy is a doctor recruiting manager with Heartland Dental. She started in team recruiting at Heartland eight years ago and worked her way up to her current position in doctor recruiting. I'd like to welcome Stacy Smith. No, no. Hi, everyone. I apologize for that. Um, gotta love technology these days. Uh, my name is Stacey Smith, and I'm happy to be joining you this evening in order to discuss a little bit more about those tough questions that you need to be asking during the interview process. I'm going to start out by letting you know a little bit more about myself. So I am a doctor recruiting manager with Heartland Dental. I actually never would have pictured myself in the dental industry. I started as a second grade teacher and didn't even know dentistry from this perspective existed. A lot of people joke around that I still deal with second graders on a daily basis, um, kind of. So we'll just say that I'm kidding just a little bit. But as far as myself, let me show you here. Here's a picture of my husband and I. So Matt and I have been married for 10 years. We've been together since high school, so I don't wanna age myself too much. Um, but in that time, we really enjoyed traveling. Our one thing that we're getting ready to do this year is we actually are checking off an item on our bucket list. We are headed to Bora Bora, so we're really excited about that. And on the left-hand side, you're going to see a picture of us fishing. So I'm an Indiana girl, born and raised and bass fishing is something that you do in your spare time. Uh, my husband's an avid fisherman, so he takes pride in it. I purely go out on the boat just to outfish him. So my number one goal is to always bring in more bass than he can. Um, and then sometimes I think he doesn't wanna take me fishing anymore. And then on the right hand side, you're going to see a picture of my dog, Daisy. So uh, she is nicknamed Crazy Daisy because she's almost 10 and she still acts like she's two. So we're waiting for the day that she decides to slow down. Uh, with regards to my career at Heartland Dental, I did start in team recruiting and I have since moved into managing a team of doctor recruiters. I've enjoyed every second of it. Honestly, as a recruiter, my favorite thing is to build relationships meet new people, and then connect those individuals with the career that they're looking for once they get out of school. Everybody that you work with at Heartland or if you're surrounded with are going to be the ones that love what they do and it's just a rewarding career to be surrounded by like-minded individuals that um, have a great goal in mind. So today what we're going to talk about is making sure that we're asking the right questions. It's a vital part of the interview process that you ask the right questions in order to figure out if this is going to be a win-win situation for yourself. And it's also demonstrates to the recruiter or to the company that you're interviewing with that you've done your research and you know exactly what you're looking for. And so I'm here today to try to break that down for you. You will see that my goal by the end of this uh, webinar is for you to have some questions that matter. So what does that look like um, and what 
can you use from a question perspective in order to set up yourself and to make sure that, again, you find that win-win scenario. We're also going to break down the fact that this is a lot like dating, so we're gonna break that down for you. We're going to talk about tough questions. So if anything, my goal is for you to walk away with some tough questions that you really feel confident in asking by the time that this webinar is over. And then we also want you to take those questions and make them your own. Obviously, I can give you word for word exactly what you should ask, but you want it to feel comfortable. So you want it to roll off your tongue and make sure that it's something that sounds like what you would say in an interview process. So like I said, it's a lot like dating. Uh, a lot of people are like, okay, what does that mean? So think about that first time that you dated somebody. I actually think back to when I first started dating my now husband, um, boyfriend at the time. You're a little bit nervous, you're excited because you met somebody new. And so you really just want to get to know that individual. Um, obviously you're not gonna just sit there and stare at each other, that'd be awkward. So you wanna make sure that you start to ask questions about goals, common interests, uh, where do you guys complement one another? And can you see this being something that's a long-term fit? With that, you want to make sure, again, that you're going back and forth. And in an interview, it really should be a back and forth dialogue. So you really should feel like you're just sitting there hanging out with a friend, um, catching up with old times, and just getting to know that individual. Somebody that I think of is a doctor that I hired four years ago um, that I took it from an interview to just a, a professional ongoing relationship. So I can reach out to him at any time, ask him questions from the dental industry. And so it's just been a great experience. Uh, I think of Dr. Rodriguez. So I interviewed him um, four years ago, obviously, but I met him his second year of dental school. So it's important for those of you that are going to campus events to make sure that you're reaching out and speaking to recruiters about what they have to offer. So that's exactly what he did. He approached me his second year, started asking questions. Um, I was really engaged with Dr. Rodriguez because he did his research. He knew what Heartland had to offer, but then what he was trying to do is see where that fit in with the puzzle that he was looking for and what that career opportunity would look for. So it really impressed me that he did his research, but he was also very genuine and transparent. And I'll kind of explain that a little bit later about how important that is that you put yourself out there in order to really land uh, that career with the the employer that you're interviewing with. So again, making sure that you're very transparent and that again, you have that ongoing relationship back and forth conversation during the interview process. One of the tough questions that I wanna start with is actually patient flow. So I like to think of patient flow in two different ways that I want you to really wrap your mind around how do you answer or ask those questions when you're sitting down with a recruiter. There's two different ways. So you're gonna wanna get a little bit more information with regards to their systems when it comes to patient flow and then also new patients. So what I mean by systems, what kind of systems are in place that ensure a smooth patient flow um, process in the practice? So let's start out for pointers. At the very beginning, when a patient walks in, what kind of process do they have in place or system that allows for a two-on-one -on -one patient transfer process? So are they just having the person check in and then you tell them, go back to oper operatory 10? Or are they coming in and you are then introducing them to the next individual that's going to walk them back? The patient experience, again, is going to align with whether your philosophy is the same way or exactly what you're looking for. So that's an important question to ask. Something else that comes to mind uh, with processes is do they give the patient an appointment before they leave? So it's important that you are building a relationship with each patient that walks in. So what is that practice's philosophy? Do they give them a, uh, an appointment card before they leave or is it just something that they um, send them on their way and then they call them later? Again, making sure that it aligns with your thought process and the last thing that I would think in regards to systems is what do they do for surveys? Do they send out any kind of surveys that are going to allow the patient to do a customer service survey? At the end of the day, if we're not landing well with our patients or your practice isn't, you could be losing those patients. So you wanna make sure that you're building that relationship and that you are landing on the right foot when being introduced to each patient that walks in your door. Now, from a patient flow, as far as new patients, we know that new patients are a huge practice builder. And 
we're paying for marketing. So you want to ask them, okay, what does the advertising look like? How many new patients can I expect to see per month? What does the flow look like in the practice? And you're wanting to kind of gauge what kind of advertisement are they doing? Are they doing mailers? Are they doing online social media? Um, just trying to get an idea of how those patients are coming to that practice so you can retain them. And then also ask them, do you have any kind of referral program? What kind of referral program are going to put patients in my practice so that I can build that relationship with them and then get them to want to stay with me in this practice? And then with the patients, so you're looking at three different ways technically. If you're walking into a brand new practice, you want to see how you establish, is it a 50-50 split with the other doctor with regards to new patients? If you're walking into an established patient practice, and you're gonna be the only doctor, obviously we know you'd be taking over all of the patients. However, if you're walking into a scenario where there's another doctor there, do you get to take the established patient base of the existing doctor, or are you going to be required to get all the new patients? So again, important to see what that looks like because that's gonna kind of gauge how busy you are and what your patient flow looks like. I would say the best answer would be the 50-50 split. However, keep in mind too, that if a doctor's already built relationships with those patients, you wouldn't wanna jeopardize that. So you really would wanna hope for 100% of all new patients for that month so that you can continue to build that relationship and make those patients your own. You also wanna keep in mind too, from a family perspective, ask them what is the protocol when it comes to a family? So if Mrs. Johnson comes in and is seen by Dr. Smith, is that individual going to continue to see them? And then if husband and the children come in, are they able to see Dr. Smith as well? Or is it a free for all and you just hand it to whatever dentist is available? It's important because you've established a patient philosophy um, of lifetime care with that patient. So you wanna make sure that your whole family is getting that exact same care. So again, just a question that some doctors don't think to ask, but you definitely wanna make sure you do. The next question that I want to go over is with regards to specialists in the whole treatment planning. Uh, a lot of people don't think to ask this, but it's actually pretty important. You want to see, are there specialists on site and are you required to feed them procedures or are you allowed to do the procedures yourself? Okay, what I mean by that is, do you have the autonomy to make decisions? So if you see that patient, are you able to treatment plan and produce that procedure, or are you required to give it to um, a specialist? What I have found is I've interviewed doctors that they've been a few years in and they've had a specialist on site. They didn't think anything of it at the beginning. And then three years later, they're calling me saying, Stacy, I actually don't get to see um, any more endo and I'm losing my skills when it comes to oral surgery. I can pretty much guarantee it's probably because a specialist is on site and they usually answer yes. So it's important to see, are specialists gonna be on site? Are you gonna be required to feed them? Because what you find is specialty can charge a higher fee, therefore it's a higher production builder in the practice. But we know most general dentists are coming out and with advanced technology, you're able to be well-rounded or most want to be well-rounded and they really try to go after the super GP model. And so it's trying to be as well-rounded, keep as much in-house as possible, and you're gonna be more productive from that perspective. And you're not gonna be calling me four years from now saying, hey, um, all these skills, I've lost them from dental school. The goal is to continue to project your career forward um, and not go backwards in the information and the skill sets that you learned in dental school. The next topic we're gonna to actually talk about has to do with insurance. So what insurances do they accept in the practice? A lot of doctors go, okay, so what does that matter? I'm gonna be honest with you and just put this out there, all patients deserve treatment, that's obvious. Um, but when you break down insurances, it could look a little bit different based off of your philosophy of care. So if your philosophy is one thing and you are being forced to see something different because of the insurance dictating your treatment, that could be a conflict in what you're looking for. So we are trying to find that win-win, like I said earlier. With that being said, you can kind of break it down two different ways. You've got PPO and fee-for-service. And so PPO, when I think of that, I think of 
um, higher fees. I think of quality care versus quantity. Um, and I think of patients being able to actually get well-rounded dentistry, sit down and not have an insurance company dictate their treatment or what they can afford to move forward with. So a lot of dentists tend to gravitate towards practices that do offer the PPO and fee-for-service. The other side of things though, is you have your HMO and your Medicaid. And so with HMO and Medicaid, patients, you have to see a certain amount of numbers in order to be productive, okay? So what that looks like basically for you guys when you're going out to interview, is you wanna make sure that you are going to be able to do quality work versus quantity, but if you have to hit a certain number, it becomes more about the quantity. So you have to do a certain amount, and therefore you're gonna find doctor, or sorry, patients that will actually kind of dictate their treatment. I've heard stories out there where a doctor has had a patient walk in and say, um, my insurance covers five extractions, so I want you to pull all five of my teeth and I just wanna move on. And that's not the lifetime care that you're wanting to provide because now we're pulling teeth and we're giving them dentures versus trying to save uh, their teeth and, and moving forward with lifetime care. The other thing that you'll see too is a high no-show rate with your HMO and your Medicaid patients. Um, they don't tend to value their uh, treatment as much as the ones that are paying a little bit more for it. So again, it goes against that quality versus quantity side of things. And then to kind of break it down for you, PPO would look like $1,000. This is just kind of a, an example of a fee. So it's $1,000 for one crown versus the fee of an HMO, which would be $500 for a crown. So that's where I'm saying that if you do one crown under PPO and you earn $1,000, you would technically have to do two crowns on the HMO side in order to earn the same amount. And so again, making sure that it aligns with your philosophy and is it something that you want to do moving forward with your career. Okay, the next slide that we're gonna talk about is malpractice. A lot of people know about it. Um, I know that we have a lot of individuals that actually come to your school and talk about malpractice. They try to sell you on their, their plan. And so what I wanna really do is educate you to be making sure that you're making the right decision. What does that look like for you? And I'm gonna break it down for you. So if you go to a company you wanna ask, okay, first question right off the bat, do you cover my malpractice, okay? And it can be either or, I've seen both. I've seen them say yes, and I've seen them say no. So if they say yes, here's the thing, that's great, but what are they covering? You need to break down what does that policy look like? So to me, there are two policies out there. You have your occurrence policy, and then you have your claims made policy, okay? Those are your two policies. If a company does provide, they cover your policy, I would ask them what kind it is. If you find out that it's an occurrence policy, that's great. In my opinion, occurrence is probably the best way to go. It does cost more upfront, so I'm just giving you a heads up because you're gonna hear a lot of great offers out there or there's cheaper ones from a claims made policy, but you don't always wanna go with the cheaper because it's not always better. So with an occurrence policy, it covers you while you're in that practice. Should you leave that practice, the policy's underneath your name, and you can take that policy with you where you go, okay? But if you do a claims made policy, that is a policy that covers you for that practice, and you can definitely take it with you where you go. However, it seems too good to be true. So not only did you not have to pay very much up front, but what I find is then you have to buy that tail policy on the back end. And what's becoming conflicting is that doctors have called me in the past and said, Stacy, they covered my malpractice, but didn't tell me about the tail I was gonna have to purchase. So if you can kind of visualize, picture a tail, um, exactly what I'm saying. And if you've worked for six years, you have a six year long tail, okay? And basically that tail is going to swing around and cover that patient for a lifetime. And that's exactly what I just said, a lifetime. So if Mrs. Jones gets a crown first year out of school and you saw Mrs. Jones, you took care of her crown and you were on a claims made policy, but you leave that practice. Let's say you leave two years later and now you're on practicing somewhere else. If Mrs. Jones comes back and says something's wrong with that crown, your tail, no matter whether you're at that practice or not, has to continue to cover her. 
I've seen tail policies cost anywhere from $2,000 all the way up to $8,000. Um, on the, the higher end. I would imagine they get even higher the more you've been practicing. So I really recommend you do your due diligence with regards to what malpractice you're walking into, what does it truly cover, and what's going to um, align with what you're looking for. The other thing to keep in mind too, if a company suggests a specific malpractice, I would recommend you go with it. There is a method to their madness. The goal is that they have a legal team. Most DSOs out there do have a legal team. And so they're versed in the policy. That is why they're making a recommendation towards a specific malpractice. When they know that policy forwards and backwards, they can protect you before a claim's made. So that again, just feeling that extra cushion or that extra coverage um, for you to feel safe to be able to practice dentistry exactly the way you want to, providing the best care for your patients. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is hours. Some people are like, okay, why are we talking about hours? That seems very um, surface level, but I, I recommend you get deeper on the hours, okay? So really break those down. What does that look like? You wanna make sure you have the best access to care. After all, you did go to dental school, and so you are in this in order to take care of your patients. With the best access to care, you need to make sure that your practice is open as much as possible to be able to take care of those patients. What I would recommend first is that you actually do research in the area. So if you're really considering, let's say a private practice in the area and you are kind of trying to figure out hours, what are all the other practices open? Are they open eight to five? Is any of them open on a Friday? Are any of them open on a Saturday? Would it be in your best interest in order to open on those days and would you have a team that would support you to do so? So eight to five, I'm gonna tell you right now, I know most doctors come out of school and say, I just wanna work eight to five. That sounds great, but you're coming right out of school. So hit the ground running, put a lot of work into your career up front um, because we know that you're gonna start to um, start your career, start a family, and then you're gonna need more work-life balance. And so you're not gonna be able to do those kind of things right out of school later on in life. So make sure that you're checking the hours, seeing what that looks like. If there's another dentist in the practice, see where you overlap. The goal is for you to not overlap. I would suggest an expanded hour, so even the evening, maybe in the morning. The reason I suggest that is because if you are overlapping with the other doctor, then again, you're having to split those patients. But if you're the only doctor um, to provide care in the evening, guess what? All of those patients are gonna be your production because you're there to take care of them. So again, making sure that you're looking at it from a business sense, what makes sense for you, and then what makes the best sense for the practice and the patients as well. The other thing that you wanna keep in mind too is work-life balance. So if you are gonna pick up a Saturday, which I've seen some four hour Saturdays be more profitable than a full day during the week, uh, especially if you have those working class individuals that really don't have time to take off from work, they would love an evening hour or coming in at 9 a.m. on a Saturday. So I would definitely consider that if it is an option for you in your current um, situation. The other thing that I want you to think about too is what does the team dedication look like, okay? It's easy for you to say, yep, I wanna work Saturdays, but if you don't have a team that's willing to support that, that may be a conflict for you. So you definitely wanna check into that, see if they're open to that as well. And the other thing to think about too is what kind of treatment as far as hours are you gonna be able to provide? If you can convert a crown at let's say 445, but practices used to closing at five, is that the team that's going to actually try to turn that procedure away and schedule an appointment for them to come back? Or do you have a dedicated team that's going to stay the extra 30 minutes in order to make sure that you get that crown taken care of and that patient satisfied before they walk out the door? Again, just breaking down what kind of staff are you looking at and what's going to partner with you with regards to the hours. Okay, the next thing that I wanna talk about, a lot of people um, think about it. I'm going to preface this with, please, please, please do not lead with a compensation question. I think that that really drives recruiters nuts. We want to know you're dedicated before you just throw the compensation out on the table question. So make sure that you've asked all your other questions, but it is important to really break down compensation during your interview process so you, again, you know exactly what you're walking into. 
please do not lead with how much time do I get off and what am I going to get paid? Um, our recruiters, it throws up red flags. We're like, okay, they are not dedicated to this practice. They don't seem like a long-term fit. So we want to try to avoid those red flags if at all possible. With breaking down compensation, it's important to look at a few different things. Are you gonna receive a percentage of collections? Or are you going to receive a percentage of production? Are you gonna receive a base salary? Is that a guaranteed base salary for a full year? Does it only cover you for six months? Do you get a daily base? Does that last for the entire year? Or is it for the first 90 days and then it falls off and then you're just paid a percentage of collections? All of these questions are really important to ask because we know that you're coming out of dental school and you're gonna have debt got to pay your bills. So you want to make sure that you know exactly what that looks like. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you, compensation is tricky. doesn't matter how you spin it, where you look at it. Every company, private practice pays a little bit different. And so it's really trying to grasp the concept and run the numbers in your head. So I'm going to help you. If you're doing a percentage of collections, the next question you need to ask is what is your overall percentage of collections in your practice on a monthly basis, okay? If you're only gonna get 30% of collections, but they only hit 85% of collections, then your 30% looks a lot smaller than the 30 that they told you. So it's important to ask that because you're only getting collections. I would say 85 is actually pretty low. So I would be questioning, okay, what is going on with regards to the front desk and collecting my money? Again, another question that a lot of doctors don't think to ask. The other thing that you want to check into too, because 95% is a lot higher. 100%, that's great. I would feel confident in those percentages. The other thing that you wanna look into is what is the fee schedule? So we discussed that earlier. You heard me mention $500 for HMO and $1,000 for a PPO. Let's say you get 28% of collections, but it's HMO. You're only getting 28% of $500, but let's say you get another offer that's 25% of collections, but it's PPO, so it's $1,000. Last time I checked, I would rather have 25% of the higher fee schedule uh, versus 28% of the lower fee schedule. So again, breaking all those down and really building yourself up to feel confident in making that correct decision. So fees do play a part into it. The other thing, what comes out of your pay? Does anything come out of your pay? Are you required to pay for labs? Labs gotta get paid from somewhere. So do they hit the overhead of the practice? Do they take 30% out of your paycheck or do they make you split them 50-50? These are all things that you want to think about that are going to impact your paycheck at the end of the day. Also, be able to ask the practice P&Ls. What does the profit and loss statement look like? What kind of information do you need to gain in order to make a good business decision? Are they painting you rainbows and butterflies or are they being transparent? Honestly, throws up a red flag to me if they can't be straightforward with their answer. If there's too much gray going on and they can't exactly tell you where the money goes when it comes in on a weekly, I would say even daily basis, Again, red flag. So make sure that you're looking into the company or that private practice as well, because at the end of the day, if you sign anything, you are dedicated to that practice. And so you wanna make sure you know exactly what that looks like. And this is gonna be a win-win situation for you. So I would definitely be able to break down the areas of opportunity. So does the current doctor refer out X, Y, and Z procedures? If they do, is that a procedure you can keep in house? That would impact compensation. That means that the current doctor right now makes this amount of money, but if you kept this in-house and you knew that the fees look like this, you do the math per procedure and you can break that down and go, okay, I can contribute another 70,000 um, on a quarterly basis to this practice, which would allow me to receive this kind of profit from a compensation standpoint. So again, don't lead with compensation, but definitely be comfortable asking and trying to break it down, but really break it down. So really get to know what the fees look like, what comes out of it and what kind of percentage. So percentage of this or percentage of that, but if it's a smaller fee, um, you can do the math and you'll see that it does not equal. Okay, so really what you wanna do at this point is you want to be able to craft your own questions. You wanna make them your own. I can tell you, you could have written down every single question that I asked you to go into an interview and ask, but you've got to make them feel your own. So you wanna make sure that you're genuine. 
Um, and you can craft these questions based off of doing your research on the company or the practice website. My number one thing to warn you on is make sure you do your research so that you don't walk in and ask a question that's in plain view on their website. Okay, so if any of these questions I've asked you to ask are actually listed somewhere on their website, then just let them know. I read on the website this, and now I have a further question and dig a little bit deeper with them. But whatever you do, don't walk in and ask a question that you could have done in your research. That shows that you're dedicated and that you're interested in this opportunity. The other thing is, is to look up articles, look up patient reviews. This is going to tell you exactly what kind of situation you're walking into. You can even look at glass door reviews for some of your larger DSO companies as well. Did the previous doctors like it here? Do they like the company in general? Um, again, got to make sure you know you're going to have to see a lot of good and you're going to also see a lot of bad. And so you have to figure out where that happy medium is. Um, because we all know that anybody can stick a review on there. But if you're starting to see consistency, then you want to dig a little bit deeper and see, does this align with your philosophy? And can you see yourself in this location for a lifetime? And then I want you to align yourself um, with regards to your values. So determine what those values look like. Decide what you are willing to do or what you are not willing to forego um, with your values. And does this practice or that organization work for you? Are they going to be able to align with you and set you up for success in a long-term career? And then the next thing you're going to see later on is my contact information. I would love for you to be able to reach out to me. I will do my best to respond to everybody that does. Um, but if you have questions for me, if you want to run a scenario by me, again, it's my favorite thing with regards to recruiting is to build those relationships and really, whether it's coming on board with my company or somewhere else, knowing that you've made the best decision for yourself and that you're going to be able to um, stay somewhere for a long time and be happy that you made that decision because you did your due diligence. Okay, so a little bit of extra information on top of all of your um, tough to ask questions, you wanna make sure that you think of some other things. So I know everybody that's watching this are at different stages in dental school. You've got your D4s that are interviewing as we speak. So they're taking this information and they're totally running with it, hopefully. Um, and then you've got D3s that are really trying to establish what their values look like. What do I want to do when I get out of school? What does that look like? And so they're really trying to figure out what that does, looks like so that they can then go out and start the interview process. Then you've got your D1s and 2s. 1s are probably trying to figure out how they even got into dental school or what the heck they're doing there. And so they're really just trying to wrap their mind around being in dental school. That's fine. Uh, and then you've got your D2s that are really trying to just figure out the clinical aspect. And then you're going to start to build into what your values look like. And then you're going to start the interview process. It's never too late. OK, so hopefully if there are D1s on here, you are taking some good notes and you're just going to be awesome at the interview process by the time you got there because you've been doing your research now. Um, it's important that if we're on campus, we're at schools, go up to those individuals, start talking to them so that you can get to know them a lot more. Like I said earlier, Dr. Rodriguez walked up to me his second year. He was still nervous. He didn't know what he was doing, but he knew that he liked people that were friendly. And so him and I were able to connect. He felt like I was approachable. And so we just really kicked it off. And every time he had a question, he knew I was approachable. He could reach out to me and I'd give him exactly the answer, um, whether it was good, bad, or the ugly. First thing that I want you to think of too, on top of this, what does your elevator pitch look like? A lot of people are like, okay, how does that have anything to do with interviewing? One of a recruiter's pet peeves is asking them, I kind of warm them up by saying, hey, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? And essentially, I'm just trying to find some commonality so that we can hit off our conversation and make it feel like that relationship or that ongoing conversation we are talking about. If they respond back to me, I don't really like to talk to my or talk about myself. It's kind of a red flag to me. You have to put yourself in our shoes. As recruiters, we want to make sure that we can see you treating the patient. So if you can't sell yourself, how can I trust that you're going to be able to sell the treatment to the patient that's sitting in your chair? So again, it's one big rotating um, circle with, re with regards to the interview process. So what does that elevator pitch look like? Some of you are going to be graduating with 60 in your class, some 100. I've seen some classes of 200. 
So what, if you scan the room, what is going to make you stand out from the rest of those doctors that are in your class? How are you going to set yourself apart and stand out so that that recruiter walks away and remembers you? So you wanna make sure you have that. If you have two minutes to put it all out there, what does that look like? That is your elevator pitch and I want you to work on that. Get good at it and be comfortable discussing it so that you can really sell yourself in the interview. Okay. The other thing that I want you to think about is you've got to be authentic. You got to be genuine. Make sure that you come off as your true self um, and don't seem rehearsed or like you did the research online and you sound like a robot. Again, I have to be able to connect the dots that you are going to be able to relate to the patients, that you're going to be approachable to the patients. At the end of the day, we have to make sure that you're on point with your customer service and that we can see the patients wanting to give their treatment and, and let you take care of their treatment and then give your money to them. So we want to make sure that we're taking care of them from that perspective. The other thing that I don't have listed on here, but make sure you look at red flags. So not only are we interviewing you, but you got to be interviewing us. That's why I want you to research your questions, make sure you're asking those hard questions. But if you're running into a company or a private practice that they just seem like they're painting a rosy picture, that would throw up a red flag. So you want to make sure that they are giving you very transparent answers, that they are going straight for, straight to the answer with regards to instead of going around the bush. Um, so you don't want somebody that's going to beat around the bush, try to change the subject. That's a red flag. So you want to make sure that while you're interviewing that you feel they're coming back to you with genuine answers as well. And again, that's going to allow you to decide, is this a win-win situation for yourself? The last thing that I want to bring up that a recruiter loves and kind of nerd out on this is we love a good hard close. We want to know that that candidate hard closes us at the end. A lot of people are like, okay, what does that mean? I want to make sure that you have established some kind of question at the end that says, Stacy, when can I expect to hear from you next? What does your timeline look like? You want to make sure that you are asking me so that you know exactly when to follow up. Okay. Now it is okay within 24 hours. If you've been communicating via text, via email, it is okay to reach out and respond, hey, thank you for your time, send them a text message to your recruiter or send an email. Whatever has been the form of communication, that's completely fine these, this time of day or this time of year um, from that perspective. Used to be handwritten cards. We, we don't necessarily need that anymore, but we want that hard close. Here's the reason why. If I come back to you and tell you, you will hear from me within three to four days, that means I do not want you to turn into a stage five cleaner. Yes, you heard me correctly. You all know what I'm talking about. Um, when you're dating, let's take it back to the dating. You probably had that one individual you went on a date with and they became a stage five clinger and you couldn't get rid of them. So don't do that in the interview process. I really need you to, to bear with me here and stick it out. If they say three to four days, wait three to four days until you reach out to follow up stating that you haven't heard from them, okay? Not day one, not day two, make sure that it's three to four days out. You do not wanna come off as desperate in your interview process. I want you to leave your interview with the confidence. Recruiters look at it like, okay, I put it all out there on the table. And so they look at those candidates going, you know what, they're confident. Those are the ones that they're in the behind the scenes working, trying to figure out how to get that individual on board. The ones that turn into the stage five clingers, it's a, it's a little bit of a red flag to a recruiter. They get a little bit nervous about the desperation of trying to find a job and what that looks like. So I promise you, hard close the recruiter, ask them when you can expect to hear from them and then have your plan in following up with them. Okay, so earlier we did talk about, here's my contact information. So again, feel free to email me. Um, I will do my best to get back to you in a timely manner, but send me your questions. If you have questions that you don't wanna ask on here or you have scenarios or anything that you're running into from a challenge, again, I just wanna make sure that I'm setting you up for success. I would love it if you came to us, but I also know that there's other opportunities out there. Um, you could go to private practice, other DSOs, there are uh, private health care facilities, even residencies. You can use some of this in your residency approach because I know there's interviews there too. So make sure that you're using this information. 
The second thing I'm going to leave you with too is make sure you create a LinkedIn account. Okay, this is your professional platform for social media. This is where a lot of individuals get on there. I believe a lot of dental schools are asking the dental students to create one, but if not, I would take yourself and set it apart. I will do research and see if I can find that student on LinkedIn. Get on there, create a profile, and then request me to be your friend. I can be your first one if you want me to. Uh, but while you're on LinkedIn, what you can do is really use this platform to connect with other dental industry people. So again, starting your network in the dental industry, making those connections. I've seen people post openings on LinkedIn. I've received inbox um, in mail with regards to, hey, I'm moving to this area. Do you have any opportunities? Those are the individuals that are going above and beyond to, to express their interest. And I've been known to try to figure out how we can create a position for that dentist. So keep that in mind when you are getting ready to, to start looking for your career. It's never too soon to go ahead and create that LinkedIn profile, keep it up to date and read some really cool articles, learn a lot from it. It's, it's a good thing for you to get started. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to move to the Q&A. OK. How do I get started with Heartland? Where do I? Where do I start off to express interest and learn more? So that's a great question. It's never too late to start expressing interest now. So some individuals will come up to us on campus and express their interest that way. We are heavily involved um, on campuses. We have an entire team just dedicated to outreach of dental students on site. So make sure you approach one of them. If you hear Heartland's coming, make your presence known. The other way, let's say that we are not going to be there anytime soon, but you're very interested, you can go to our website and find a position and click on it. And then if you have a certain state and you're not finding what you need, my contact information is on there. Please don't hesitate to email me and I will get you in touch with the right, right recruiter across the U.S. This next question, I'm actually glad somebody asked um, on the slide that there was a little error on your email address. It is Heartland with an R in there, not Heatland. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. Sure. And I'll have it come up again at the end with the contact information. <laughs> yeah, somebody asked about that. Just to double check, it is Heartland. Yes. Um, but here's another question. How can I apply this information to GPR interviews? That's a great question. So in a GPR, you can kind of spin that. Um, because you need to interview them as well and make sure that this is going to be a fit. So asking some of those difficult questions, what kind of procedures are you going to be able to learn? Do you feel you might be taking a step back? So in some GPRs, there's some amazing ones out there, but in a few of them, I've had dental students actually come to me after the fact um, and feel like they might have taken a step backwards in their dental career. And I mean, for example, this is just throwing this out there. Um, one GPR had a dentist placing amalgam. We know that that's kind of a step back in technology. And so with this industry constantly growing, um, this individual felt like they started learning some old school techniques and really wanted to be doing more state of the art ideas. So again, really making sure it aligns with what are you trying to learn and what values are you looking to take your career to the next level? Okay, next question. How far back is okay to have info on LinkedIn? I have my LinkedIn since high school, so I'm not sure if I should keep the awards I got in high school. Ooh, great question. I would say that you want to keep it relevant information. Now, if it's an award that is going to help show leadership um, or show something different with regards to your characteristics, then I wouldn't say that it's against uh, to put it on there. I have mine back to my teaching um, career. So mine does show that I used to be a teacher. I think that that's what sets me apart from a recruiter standpoint. So I do keep that on there. But again, that's all of my college and, and further. So I think use your best judgment, um, but make sure that it does, it is professional. So if you need to keep things very simple, that's what I would recommend you do. 
Okay, does a residency like a one year GPR or AEGD on a candidate's resume increase hiring chances or compensation packages? That is a great question. I get that all the time. So it depends on what that residency or that GPR AGD looks like, honestly. If it's a well known, um, basically well known AGD um, path that you've chosen to take, that does increase your chances. Um, we do look at that, but we also call Heartland a mini residency. So I tried not to plug Heartland too much, but I do know that Heartland Dental does provide a lot of CEs within your first year. And so a lot of people see it as a mini residency and the ability to start earning money uh, right off the bat, but also advance your career. So it does, it can help, um, but I would not be um, upset if you are asking and they don't feel like it's weighted. So again, knowing that you did additional education is great. A lot of people, practices and recruiters are gonna ask why you chose to do that residency. So make sure that you have answers for that as well. Um, why was it that you decided instead of going straight out into the field and practicing dentistry right away, what held you back from wanting to um, go straight out there instead going to a residency. And I don't want to say held you back, but what created that fear or that doubt for you to not want to just go out and hit the ground running? How important are CE courses to be an ideal candidate? CE courses are pretty important. Um, and so I kind of joke around when I hear of CEs. Those that pro send me a resume or a CV that has an entire page full of um, CEs, I start to ask questions, okay? Um, and so I wanna make sure that if you went to a CE, there's an ROI there. So CEs are very important um, with regards to what you're learning. We are seeing that you're constantly challenging yourself and you're trying to project your career forward. So you wanna make sure that you are attending CEs, but at the end of the day, what are you learning from and what are your patients benefiting from you because you took those CE courses. So be able to speak to each one of them. If you say, oh, I took this one and I say, hey, what did you learn from that? And you say, oh, I didn't really learn anything. I just wanted to go. We start to see red flags. So make sure that you're putting your investment time-wise into the CEs that are gonna make the biggest impact on your patients at the end of the day. Knowledge is great, you can do a lot of research, but what is it that you can put into your practice that's going to allow those patients to have better care because you took that CE course? Okay, next question. Um, I'm interested in a certain location right now because my fiance lives there, but will only be there for two years. What is a good way to talk to a recruiter about this and keep them interested in hiring me? That is a great question. So the great news is I, a lot of you know that I started in Indiana with Heartland Dental. So when I said I was Heartland born and raised, that's actually where I started as a team recruiter. And then I transferred to Florida with Heartland. So that's one of the pros with regards to Heartland is the ability to transfer. We know that life happens. And so it's letting them know this is where I'm at right now in my career stage. I'm willing to fully dedicate myself to this practice and making this where I plant my my um, seeds and everything from that. We wanna make sure that you are invested to that location, but I would be transparent with them. I definitely wouldn't hide it from them. I would, and I think that they're going to respect you more so for putting, coming forth with that information versus um, hiding it from them and then them finding out later and then being upset by it. Could you elaborate on the difference between percentage of production versus percentage of collections and how to go about comparing offers? Yes. So percentage of collections, it means that it is the money that the front desk collected. That's why I want you to make sure that you're asking what that percentage is for that practice, for that company. So if they're only collecting, so you basically do all your treatment, okay, for the month. And then they like to take the entire month to get your collections. In our perspective, this is what they like to do. Uh, so they like a full month in order to gather all of the money that they collected from insurance companies, um, from the patient payments, all of that. 
and then you are going to get your percentage off of that. So if it's not the full 100%, your collections could look a little bit different. From a production standpoint, whatever you treatment plan and produce, you're gonna get that percentage right off the top. So you don't actually have to wait for collections. So it's kind of determine um, what is going to make most sense for you. Um, I'm seeing a lot more percentage of collections versus a percentage of production. But again, checking into that. So if the production um, percentage is high, what comes out of your paycheck? Are you required to pay for half the labs and is that going to kind of dictate what kind of treatment you provide your patient? Hopefully that kind of answered that question. Next question is, are you interested to hire international dentists with DDS in the US with a pedo, with pedo experience? So it varies across the board. Um, when I ask the, or talk to you guys about the specialty slide, our goal is to have super GPs. We want as many well-rounded doctors as possible. However, we do invite those that want to um, do pedo on the side. So we have a lot of general dentists that love to see kids. And um, we invite that because those patients need to be seen as well. We like to see the whole family if at all possible in a practice. Um, with regards to international dentists, we absolutely, we hire a ton of different doctors from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds. As long as you have a DMD or a DDS um, and can practice in the US, then you are most definitely eligible to apply to any position that we have available. How do you address the non-compete clauses? What if I want to work for Heartland in an area but may want to go into private practice or open a practice in the area years down the road? Okay, great question. So my recommendation, if you are in that situation, I would say to work outside of where you can see yourself being long-term, okay? So if your goal is to open your own practice in your city that you grew up in, I would then try to find a location for the Heartland, let's say a Heartland Dental location, find that outside of. So be willing to commute a little bit longer outside of so that when you do leave, your restricted covenant kicks in and does not hold you to the city or that specific area that you're looking to establish your practice. Um, I will be honest, restricted covenants look a little bit different across the U.S. Um, the more saturated we are, the smaller the number is. The more um, rural we are, then it's obviously going to be a little bit larger. So again, all up for negotiation and be able to discuss that with your recruiter for that individual location. Has anyone ever approached you about opportunities for working with specific pa patient populations, such as the elderly or those with developmental disabilities? So it depends on what the doctors are wanting to offer in their practices. Our doctors are the leaders of their practice, so they do get to kind of make those decisions. Um, you'd be surprised, I'm down in Florida, that's where I live, and we are not heavily, um, a lot of people think that, oh, you, you've gotta be all a heavy elderly population. You'd be surprised, we have a nice balance. And so it really is just depending on what kind of treatment you're willing to provide in your practice. Um, I also had another young lady that I hired that uh, brother was mentally disabled and he was able to come to her practice. She made it a point to try to advertise to the community that she was able to provide those, um, those skills for that individual specifically or for that population because we know that it takes a little bit more time, a little bit more nurturing um, and a lot more patience. And so she was able to do that, which was really cool. All right, well, thank you so much for all of the wonderful questions, everyone. If you're looking for more career-focused education, join us live at NLC in Chicago. Registration is now open. Or be sure to register for any of our upcoming Career Compass webinars, including another presented by Heartland. We want to thank you for participating in tonight's program. I would also like to thank our speaker, Stacy Smith with Heartland Dental for presenting tonight's program. It was recorded and it will be posted on ASDA's website and emailed to all participants. Participants who complete the survey at the conclusion of the webinar will be entered into a drawing for a leather portfolio and a gift certificate to make your own business cards. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and enjoy the rest of career week. Thank you.